Tonight, the president visits Ogun State to commission various projects executed by the state government. Also calls at the Lagos home of the late head of interim national government, Chief Ernest Shoneko. New political group Rescue Nigeria project blames state of the nation on what it terms politicians devoid of conscience. Says statesmen with vision beyond the next election are needed at this time. Governor Wike goes tough on illegal refinery operators in River State, orders the arrest of their sponsors identified to be prominent businessmen in the state. And Duke of York Prince Andrew stripped off his military titles and royal patronages following U.S. civil action over sexual assault allegations against him. Plus, international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, U.S. Energy Information Administration forecasts global crude oil prices to drop this year and 2023, owing to increased supply growth outpacing demand. On sports news tonight, hosts Cameroon thrash Ethiopia in their second group game to guarantee a place in the last 16 of the AFCON in style. And from the nation's capital, Vice President Oshibajo calls for the development of a competent and professional civil service to fast track the growth of the country. And it's been a busy day for the Ogun State Government as many projects have been commissioned in line with ensuring better public amenities which cut across various sectors of the economy. President Muhammadu Buhari, who is the special guest of honour, appreciates the invitation promising to begin work on federal roads which will connect major commercial hubs within the southwest and the rest of the country. For the host governor, Dakwa Abiodun, he promises that the well-being of the indigenous of Ogun states will remain top priority. Mr. President's visit to Ogun State is the first official working visit in the life of the present administration and the governor, Prince Dakwa Biodun. His counterparts in Lagos, Ondo, Ekiti, Yobe, Oyo, and Oshun, members of his executive council, traditional rulers, leaders of thoughts, were on hand to receive the president and his entourage. His mission here in the state is clear, commissioning of some landmark projects executed by the current administration in the state. I am commissioning this road on behalf of Ogun State and in Lagos State in particular and Nigeria. Thank you very much. Beginning with the newly constructed 14-kilometer Ekbe Jabodi Expressway, the president also commissioned the 42-kilometer Abiyokuta Shagamu reconstructed expressway at the Ogun State City Gate. Addressing the gathering and giving a panoramic view of the project, Governor Biodo says they were carefully chosen to improve ease of doing business, attract more investors to the state, and a new lease of life to residents and investors. Our vision is to give Ogun State a focused and coordinated governance whilst creating an enabling environment for a public-private sector partnership, which we believe is fundamental to the economic growth of the state and individual prosperity of our people. President Muhammad Buhari, who seemed to be elated by the choice and quality of projects executed, commended the governor for his foresight and purposeful leadership. Responding to the call for special status for Ogun in critical federal government's infrastructure, especially the Shagamu Ogijo Road, Papalanto and Ilaro Road, the president assured such roads and more will receive attention as the federal government leverages on tax credit option. I have also listened to your request to give priority attention to the Lagos Otter Abekuta and the Shango Otter Iduroko roads, respectively. Let me assure the people of Ogun State that these roads will see federal government attention. Its speech is over. The president is presented with a symbolic key of the city gate by Governor Dakwa Biodun. Older projects commissioned by the president include the 526 units of low and middle income housing scheme at Kobakbe and high income duplexes in Abeokuta. 
And after his visit to Ogun State, the president made his way to Lagos, where he called at the residence of the late head of the interim national government, the late Chief Ernest Shoneko, to commiserate with the family. President Buhari was accompanied to the Koei residence of the late Shoneko by Lagos State Governor, Mr. Babajide Sowolu, his Ogun and Yobe State counterparts, Prince Dapkwa Biodu and May Mala Buni. President Buhari and his entourage, who arrived at Chief Shoneko's house around four p.m. were received by members of his family. And to politics, where Rescue Nigeria Projects, RNP, a new political organization, is blaming the problem of the country on the cumulative abuse by those it calls politicians that appear to be stripped of all conscience and decency. The group believes that contrary to claims by the current administration of addressing Nigeria's problems, it has ended up making them worse. Now, this is coming from the national coordinator of RNP, Dr. Usman Bugaje, at the inauguration of the organization's national structure in the nation's capital. There, he stressed the need for statesmen whose vision go beyond the next election to the next generation. Five months after its establishment, the Rescue Nigeria Project, RNP, is taking a step further to establish its presence in states across the country as it inaugurates a national structure at this gathering. We have to stop. The leadership of the non-partisan group is concerned about the current situation in the country. The level of insecurity is undoubtedly the worst since Nigeria's independence. The trauma this has created, the drain on the country's resources this has occasioned, and the modern degeneration it has generated will continue to hunt us through the next generation. Corruption has risen to levels hitherto unheard of, diverted huge public resources to private pockets. While acknowledging that the problems of Nigeria have been caused by years of maladministration, Dr. Bugaji berates the current administration for not being able to tackle the problems. Admittedly, this crisis did not start with this administration, no. Only that this administration, despite the claim to address the problems, ended up making it worse than it was. It is both fair and accurate to say that we are where we are because of cumulative abuse the country has suffered in the hands of a brand of politicians that appear to be stripped of all conscience and decency. There have been calls for a new breed of leadership in Nigeria, and members of the group believe such calls need to be taken seriously ahead of the 2023 general elections, just as they express concern over the way the Electoral Act Amendment Bill has been handled. That is a key aspect of what the RMP must uh, seek to actually uh, address if uh, any kind of difference were to be made in terms of identifying and electing credible leaders, leaders who have character, leaders who genuinely love our country, leaders who are not clannish. The Electoral Act should not be done, at the, should not be provided at the behest of a political party. It should be for Nigerians. So it looks like we are waiting for political parties to put the acts in order before the act is signed. And that could spell danger for our democracy. The need for more political awareness has become imperative in view of the impending 2023 general elections as Nigerians look forward to electing new leaders for the country. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. Well, staying with politics, the gale of declarations for the 2023 presidential race continues and it's not limited to the ruling or progressives Congress. Aspirants on the platform of the main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, seem to have also caught the fever. The publisher of Ovation magazine, Mr. Dili Momodu, and former chairman of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Mr. Sam Mohabunwa, have announced their intentions to join the race. The two aspirants made their intentions known to the PDP national chair today in Abuja. In the last few days, 
There have been widespread speculations about my presidential bid for a second time. I've been greatly humbled by the excitement already generated, which reminds me of how it was 29 years ago when your good friend and my own adopted father, Chief Monshuda Biola, threw his heart in the ring. It is very obvious that Nigerians are eager to restore that promise of hope and the accompanying peace and joy that we lost. The time has come for full reconciliation and forgiveness and a closure of our ugly past. Nigeria urgently requires a reset and a total redirection. After due consultations with my family, friends, and some stakeholders, I've arrived at the decision to contest the 2023 presidential election, presidential election on the platform of our great party, PDP. My mission is to uh, visit the chairman of our party, uh, distinguished Senator Yocha Ayu, to have um, what I call a goodwill New Year visit to him to discuss issues relating to PDP and its manifest destiny for Nigeria at this season, and also to fully communicate to him one-on-one -on -one my desire to run for the office of President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria come 2023 on the platform of our party, the People's Democratic Party. Away from politics, Governor Yesun Wike of River State appears to be matching words with action in his effort towards ending activities of illegal refinery operations in the state. The governor has ordered the arrest of the perpetrators, some of whom are identified to be prominent businessmen in the state. He gave the order after inspecting two illegal refining sites recently discovered in Iquiri and Emoha local government areas. The fight to stamp out illegal refining of crude oil in River State is taking a new twist as Governor Yesam Wike, accompanied by the Commissioner of Police in the state, Eboka Friday, and other state leaders, are being led to a recently discovered artisanal refining sites in parts of the state. There has been an aggressive pursuit of operators of illegal refineries in the past two weeks after Governor Wike, in a new broadcast, directed the 23 local council chairmen to identify illegal refining sites in their territories for destruction. The governor's first port of call is this deep forest in Ogbodo in the Query local government area, where the chairman, Samuel Wanosike, leads the team to an area where some young men and women often working at night, are set to pump crude oil from vessels into these tanks, heat it to boiling point, then pass the petroleum product through these plastics and metal pipes into an improvised reservoir. In this case, a pit padded with plastic material. Thereafter, the convoy races towards Emohua, where the council chairman, Chidi Lloyd, leads a nearly 10 minutes walk through a bush path in Iba community to this site in which some of the finished products in metal and plastic reservoirs are yet to be distributed. Apparently shocked by the discoveries, Governor Wiki vowed to tackle the menace. We must stop it. And I said to the federal government, if you are not willing to do anything, don't promise people. Don't promise people. He told you, you do model. How can you allow this model? How? How? And the DPO that was involved, please tell IG. I have no right to dismiss the police officer. But if I tell IG, I don't want the man again in my state. People should take him to another state to do a bunker, not a uh, state. He also wants the police to arrest some prominent businessmen listed by the Emohua Council Chairman as financiers of this refining site. So it's a serious matter. And I'm going to take it. If I is a war, it's not poor people. Then yeah. can tell. Yeah. You must go and arrest that uh, chief WJ uh, watcher. watcher. Yeah. You must arrest that um, Subara Ohaka. Ohaka. And one uh, chief probably says a uh, You must arrest them. You must. It doesn't matter how highly placed you are. If you like be the permanent ruler, if any traditional ruler that is involved, pick it for me. Let him understand that the law does not respect anybody. The police have previously arrested and charged 18 suspects for conspiracy and involvement in the act. While these measures are expected to boost the nation's oil revenue, restore the environment and improve public health, residents here expect that it will be sustained. 
In part two after the break, planned arraignment of 11 persons, including a traditional ruler over alleged terrorism stalled at the Federal High Court Abuja as defendants' counsel challenges case competence. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The president visits Ogun State to commission various projects executed by the state government. Also calls at the Lagos home of the late head of interim national government, Ernest Shoneko. New political group Rescue Nigeria Project blames state of the nation on what it terms politicians devoid of conscience. Says statesmen with vision beyond the next election are needed at this time. Governor Wike goes tough on illegal refinery operators in, in River State, orders the arrest of their sponsors, identified to be prominent businessmen in the state. And Duke of York, Prince Andrew, stripped off his military titles and royal patronages following U.S. civil action over sexual assault allegations against him. And the scheduled arraignment of a traditional ruler in Oyo State, Oba, Solomon, Akiola and 10 others at the Federal High Court's Abuja has been stalled after the defendants' counsel challenged the competence of the case. The 11 defendants are facing a 12-count charge bordering alleged terrorism and other crimes levelled against them by the Inspector General of Police. The traditional ruler is among the nine defendants set to be at large. Their counsel, Mr. Jima Abdusalam, had challenged the competency of the case on the grounds that it's only the Attorney General of the Federation in line with provisions of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act that has powers to file a terrorism suit and not the police. He questioned the police's claim that a communal land dispute is a terrorism act. The trial judge, Justice Ubiora Iguatu, subsequently fixed February 14 to take objection of the defendants to the charges. And to security efforts to reposition the Nigerian police for more effective internal security have received a boost with the induction of operational vehicles and other items to the force. The president, who was represented at the official commissioning and presentation of the equipment in Abuja by the Minister of Police Affairs, restated his administration's commitment to equipping the police for efficient policing of the country. <laughs> Over 200 Buffalo operational vehicles, bulletproof vests and helmets donated by the Nigeria Police Trust Fund to the Nigeria Police for efficient internal security operations, ready to be inducted into the inventory of the force. The items were procured through the Nigeria Police Trust Fund as part of the modernization drive of the federal government. The Special Intervention Fund was set up by the federal government to provide state-of-the-art security equipment and other related facilities for the enhancement of the skills of the officers of the Nigeria Police Force. May I reiterate once more that the administration of President Mohamed Bahari is adequately poised to give all that is necessary to the Nigerian Police Trust Fund with a view to enable it to meet its mandate and attain the expectations of Nigeria, uh, expectations of Nigeria Police Force and Nigerians in general. This is part of the ongoing reformation of the Nigerian police force by prioritizing provision of modern infrastructure to aid policing in Nigeria. The cost of above operational vehicles and other security equipment procured for the Nigerian police force under 2020 budget amounted to 8 billion 790 million 321,000 the Inspector General of Police is optimistic that the equipment will improve the operational efficiency of the force. All the items provided in the trust fund for the Nigeria Police Force were largely in line with the requisite, or requisite professional specifications and they have been tested and found to be. We will continue to partner with the trust fund and we will not rely in our rendering any form of assistance and support to ensure that the Nigeria Police Trust Fund maintains the momentum while achieving its laudable objectives to the satisfaction of Nigerians.
The operational vehicles and security equipment are the rafter commissioned. The buffalo trucks are considered rugged and capable of withstanding tough geographical terrains. And let's go over to Abuja. Terry Kumi standing by with more stories. Hi, Terry. Well, hello, Millicent. Let's stay with the issue of security. An unspecified number of traders traveling on the Kaduna Berningwari Road have been abducted by suspected terrorists. The traders who were on their way to Kano from Berningwari were said to have been kidnapped yesterday by terrorists who blocked the highway at Onguayako Forest. Although neither the state police nor the police command, neither, neither the state government nor the police command have commented on the abduction, a security source attached to the Burning Gwari local government area told Channels Television that the terrorists opened fire on motorists and in the process took several passengers away to an unknown destination. But it's a different story for three abducted students of the Plateau State Polytechnic who have been rescued unhurt by troops of Operation Safe Haven deployed to Barakin Ladi local government area. The spokesperson of Operation Safe Haven, Major Isha Kutakwa, explained that the troops noticed an unusual movement of persons during patrols and immediately co conducted cordon and search in the general area, leading to the rescue of the abductees at an abandoned poultry farm. The rescued students have since been united with their families. The students, two females and one male, were abducted from one of the private hostels known as Plateau Embassy in the late hours of yesterday. Almost immediately, the troops were deployed for the rescue mission. The development of any country is closely tied to the professionalism of its civil service. Vice President Yamio Shibajo shared this sentiment while speaking at the Leadership Enhancement and Development Program organized by the Office of the Head of the Service of the Federation in Abuja. Our State House correspondent, Kayla Megwa, has more. These are civil servants from grade levels 10 to 14 who have been singled out of their various ministries, departments and agencies as having the necessary leadership potentials to ensure a more skill-based professional civil service. The training methodology adopted for LIP comprises the engagement of a mixed faculty team of local and international facilitators and industry experts. According to the Bureau of Public Service Reforms, in 2015, Nigeria had 89,226 civil servants. At the time, the Integrated Personnel and Payroll Information System had saved the federal government 185 billion naira and weeded out 65,000 ghost workers. Corruption in the civil service and its inability to retain talented staff has been a cause for concern among Nigerians for many years. The Leadership Enhancement and Development Program is supposed to address these challenges using its 10 months four-stage outlook to annually train 100 officers in various fields. Thank you very much. The Vice President draws from his personal experience on how inefficiency in the civil service impacts national development. When I uh, joined uh, the civil service as Vice President and the President, after about two months or three months of waiting for our pay to come in, the President asked me whether I had been paid. I said, Mr. President, I have not been paid. He said, I have not been paid either. And this was the President and Vice President. So the question we must ask ourselves, why does it take so long? I mean, is it even possible for a nation to develop beyond the capacity of its engine room? The empirical examples of other countries that, that we have, especially late developers, show that a highly capable and professional bureaucracy is synchronous for successful development of any country. This was certainly... These guidelines are supposed to ensure a more professional civil service. And like the Vice President said, no country can actually fully develop more than the professional capacity of its engine room, which is the civil service. These trainings are supposed to continue so we can have a country that develops as its engine room is properly remunerated and delivers more on its mandate. Kayla Megua, Channel Television News. 
After six years of operating without a board, the federal government has finally inaugurated the governing board of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Performing the ceremony in Abuja, the secretary to the government of the federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, urged the appointees to ensure the elimination of financial crimes during their tenure. The commission, by its establishment, act is empowered to prevent, investigate, prosecute and penalize economic and financial crimes and is also charged with the responsibility of enforcing the provisions of other laws and regulations relating to economic and financial crimes as well as fight even the financing of terrorism. You are however required to put in your best to combat financial and economic crimes in this country not only in this country, but even beyond the shores of our country. On his part, the chairman of the board, Mr. Abdurashid Bawa, says the commission recorded 98% success rate in the courts. Last year, it has been, uh, uh, you know, a difficult year, you know, considering Justin strike and COVID-19. But the EFCC have managed to, you know, set a new record in terms of uh, recoveries as well as, uh, you know, convictions. Last year alone, Your Excellency, we recorded uh, 2,220 convictions, which is the highest ever recorded within one calendar year by the EFCC. Um, the closest to that, Your Excellency, was in 2019, when the EFCC recorded only 1,280 convictions. Uh, looking at also the figure that uh, we have lost within the said calendar year, we lost only 37 cases, and we have won 2,220. If you do the math, Your Excellency, you will understand that uh, we have or we had 98 0.54% success rate in court. Still ahead on the news at 10, microblogging platform Twitter reacts to the lifting of the federal government's suspension of its operations. Join us again. Back to Lagos, the microblogging site Twitter has been reacting to the federal government's decision lifting the restrictions placed on its operations in the country. In a tweet by its public policy team, Twitter states, We are pleased that Twitter has been restored for everyone in Nigeria. Our mission in Nigeria and around the world is to serve the public conversation. It adds, we are deeply committed to Nigeria, where Twitter is used by people for commerce, cultural engagement and civic participation. The federal government, through the National Information Technology Development Agency, announced the lifting of the suspension with effect from midnight January 13th after seven months. And back to security following the attacks on Anka and Bukuyum local government areas of Zamfara State. The former governor of Lagos State and chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, has visited the state to commiserate with the government and the people. Speaking during the visit, he assured the state governor, Beli Matawale, that all Nigerians will support the state in getting rid of bandits terrorizing the state. On his part, Governor Matawale expressed his appreciation and outlined efforts put in place by his administration in tackling the menace of banditry. We want to tell the people of Sabra that no matter where we are, we stand with you and we are here. We want to say No one can eradicate the wish of Allah. And he says, call on me. I will answer you. Pray unto me. I will respond. The enemy of knowledge they call themselves Boko Haram, whatever. I say Boko Haram. <laughs> we need the knowledge 
We need to stop bloodletting. Nigeria will be back on track. We continue to excel. No matter what enemy tries to do, since the sad incidents of attacks in Anka and the Bukuyu local government areas, we have been inundated with message and the visitations from all over the country. The sympathy visit by the political colossus, the touring personalities and the leaders in many fields of human endeavor will further console the brave communities and the entire people of the state. Your Excellency, sir, the problems of banditry in the forest state has persisted for over a decade now. When I assumed office in 2019, I made it, uh, I made my utmost priority to address this issue, as no meaningful development could be accomplished in an atmosphere of insecurity. And away from security, the chairman of the South East Governors Forum and Governor of Ebony State, Dave Umahi, has made a strong case for an Igbo presidency, arguing that such choice will serve the greater interest of the country. Governor Umahi, who was received at the Akano Ibiam International Airport in Ugu by members of the All Progressives Congress Ebony State chapter, says the ongoing developmental strides in the state will not be hindered by his presidential ambition. There is nobody from Southeast who will become president that will not work for the greater unity of this country because we have investment everywhere. If anybody is telling you about Biafra, first and foremost, I have been saying it, Chief Elegi said it, Airborne State will never be part of Biafra. We are not Biafra. We've been so oppressed, and now we are finding our feet, and you want us to go back. We will not. We are better in a fair and equitable Nigeria, and we are not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere. We will continue to insist, to dialogue, to appeal that we be treated fairly like other regions in Nigeria. And I have hope, very seriously, some enemies of Southeast says the Southeast person become president, he will divide the country. How will he divide the country? We have investment everywhere. Do you set fire in your house? And to some company news, Solpia Nigeria Limited, manufacturer of the expression braid of hair attachments and braids, has launched the hidden tag application to stem the increasing proliferation of its hair products in the Nigerian market. At the launch of this new innovation in Lagos, the marketing manager of the company said this will help identify original expression products while eliminating the fake expression braids in the market. Expression is described as the number one synthetic hair extension brand, not just in Nigeria, but across the world. Expression rich and ultra braids dominate the market, but with this dominance comes the challenge of adulteration. The management of Soul Pier Nigeria Limited is stepping up its game for quality assurance with the launch of an app. Our company devised a new innovation that can easily be used to authenticate the genuineness of expression rich bread, ultra bread, anywhere in the world. The eating tag. This faking has run down the company that one of the factories has been shut down. We have just this one to go now. So we believe this um, hidden tag uh, um, issue is going to really check the minutes of this faking so that the company can grow. The fake is not good for your health. An official of the company explains how the app works. Wow, I hope that short video has summarized it all. Come and register. So long as you register it, 
No other person can re-register the same IQR number on that hidden tax sticker. For a major distributor, this large campaign for the app will go a long way to curb adulteration, along with the company's strategic positioning of staff in distribution centers. The company has worked on auxiliary staff to be stationed in different shops, letting the distributors and retailers and end users, that is stylists, buy from accredited distributors those whom they trust, trusted hands. I think that is what will solve some of the problems of those in the rural areas. As part of the campaign to stop adulteration, the company is asking braiders and stylists to embrace its return label promo, where one pack of the product is given for every 10 pieces of labels returned. And the University of Lagos has attained a new feat in its pursuit to become a world-class educational institution with the graduation of the first set of participants at the University of Lagos Business School. The graduation reception and the inauguration of the new alumni as a subset of the University of Lagos alumni held at the main campus of the institution at Kokahiaba. <laughs> The Human Resources Development Center Garden provides a cool and perfect ambience for guests to converge outdoor and celebrate another first in the history of the University of Lagos. The guests comprising principal officers of the university, members of the University of Lagos Business School Advisory and Academic Board, as well as principal officers of the University of Lagos Alumni Association, are honoring the pioneer set of participants who have successfully completed the Executive Master of Business Administration at the Business School. The Executive Director, University of Lagos Business School, Professor Abraham Oshunubi, takes the audience on a journey of how the vision has unfolded. A vision, ladies and gentlemen, that is not challenged is hardly a vision at all. But at ULBS, we don't glorify challenges. We don't glorify problems. Problems take you to the next level. That is why we are here. We conquer them with grace, with poise, and with style. That is what we do at the University of Lagos Business School. The Vice Chancellor's goodwill message and charge to the student is Thank delivered by the indeed. Deputy Vice Chancellor of Management Services. You are our marketers, you are our brand ambassadors, and we trust that you will not let us down. On our side, we will continue to do our best to uphold the University of Lagos brand so that together we will all be proud of the work that we are doing. The graduation of the pioneer students of ULBS also marks an important milestone in the life of the University of Lagos Alumni Association as a new body of the association is born. As a proud alumnus of the University of Lagos. The national president of the body, Dr. John Momo, does the inauguration. My country, My country. and society at large. So help me God. In his address, Dr. Momo encourages them to be problem solvers in the society and their alma mater, the University of Lagos. We cannot be called great Akokites if everything around us remains the same. We must impact positively on our environment. Let's not wait for things to happen. Let's make things happen. And instead of praying for change, let us initiate the change. Because as you all know, faith without works is dead. The keynote speaker, Dr. Akintori Akindili, addresses well, the graduates on what they need to excel. To those of you guys today, my first advice to you is stay stupid, stay foolish, stay hungry. Ask questions. Whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a manager, what will set you apart, what will enable you to use this thing you've studied for two years is your ability to ask questions, not to be deterred, to ignore opinions, to know that your life is valid, your dreams are valid, your calls are valid, and pursue them. 
Four of the graduates are awarded certificates of academic excellence in recognition of their performance during the course of the program. We present the certificate of academic excellence to Kilani Hawa. Hawaii Kilani also emerges the best graduating participant. Some of the participants speak on the experience at the ULBS and the new feat. With dedication, commitment and support of the ULBS management and the Unilag uh, management at large, uh, the dream came true. The experience was fantastic, particularly because um, we're new, so we had the opportunity to define what we wanted. The University of Lagos Business School became operational in 2018 with a mission to provide innovative business research and training, as well as build capacity to deliver business and entrepreneurial success. Let's head now for some business news. Here's Anne Wilder. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Millicent. Let's begin business news with global crude oil prices. They are expected to drop between this year and the year 2023 as pressure from increased supply and inventory build will outspace demand. And that's according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. In its short-term energy outlook for the month of January, the EIA projects that the price of international oil benchmark Brent crude is expected to see an average of $75 per barrel in 2022 and $68 per barrel in 2023. And that's from the $79 per barrel recorded in the fourth quarter of last year. At the same time, the EIA monthly data expects the US benchmark WTI crude to average $71.32 a barrel this year and $63.50 a barrel next year. For Brent crude, the price fell today by 0.92% to $83.88 per barrel. We head to Nigeria's economy. It's also expected to grow by 2.5% this year amid concerns of inflation, global oil prices, as well as rising cases of COVID-19. To this end, the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce organized its quarterly meeting with stakeholders to assess the country's economic outlook. A business correspondent, Will Ibong, reports. The Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, which was created to promote trade and investment between both countries, hosts members, policymakers, and business leaders to discuss Nigeria's economic outlook for 2022. The hidden hand is the most. The keynote speaker for the event, renowned economist Mr. Bismarck Rwani, speaks on his expectations for the year. As we look into 2022, we can say that there will be a debt problem. Exchange adjustments will take place, more towards convergence, a crawling peg will happen, and the currency effectively will appreciate, even though nominally it will depreciate in the official market, or it will appreciate in the informal market, bringing us towards convergence. Right While some participants at the right event here. raised questions uh, about how realistic the positive um, forecast for the year so is, Mr. Rwani maintains this can be achieved if certain variables so are put in place. What are the catalysts that will bring about this growth? The catalysts are productivity due to ICT, new investments, right? But even sweating the old investments that were there, the level of gross capital formation, the level of savings, I made these assumptions basically on the fact that I believe that interest rates have to increase. At the end of the event, the president and chairman of council of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, Mrs. B.C. Adeyemi, shares her optimism on the economic outlook. There are concerns, particularly around the political permutations leading up to 2023. Um, but inflation, if, if, if it comes down as it has predicted, if uh, the first subsidy is taken away, and um, if government does all that it has proposed to do according to the budget and according to the economic plan, there is reason to be optimistic. With trade, ICT, transport, manufacturing and agricultural sectors expected to drive growth in 2022, hopefully this engagement should be a reference point in the days to come. Will Ibang, 
Channels Television News. And the stock market is slightly negative at the close of business today. Investors are still switching to profit-taking mode at the close of business. Laddie Williams has the details. Hello and welcome to the stock market report. Well, the local stock market displays its dynamism at the close of today's trading session as its yesterday gains remains above 4% despite recording a slight drop in performance. Now, just about 2 billion naira is knocked off from the market's total value, which translates to a mild 0.01% decline on the All Share Index. This mild profit taken by some investors is coming a day after the NGX posted a more than 400 billion naira increase in its overall value, which was driven by bargain hunting for some blue chip equities on the exchange. Well, let's take a look at the sectoral performance. Uh, we can see that it was mostly positive sentiment, uh, but, but the loss recorded today is largely attributed to some uh, key insurance sector components, as well as some consumer goods stocks, such as Unilever, Honeywell, Flour Mills, and UACN. Meanwhile, overall activity at the NGX closed higher by 20.81%. And this tells you that investors are still keen on the equities listed on the exchange. Well, Thursday's trading session may have closed in the red, but traders say they expect a quick rebound on Friday. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Laddie Williams. It's back to you. Thanks a lot. And that's it on Business News. Back to you, Millicent. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. A German court has sentenced a Syrian colonel to life in prison for crimes against humanity in a landmark case. Anwar Razlan was linked to the torture of over 4,000 people in Syria's civil war in a jail known as Hell on Earth. The trial in Koblenz is the world's first criminal case brought over state-led torture in Syria. Razlan was accused of being a high-ranking security service officer under President Bashar al-Assad as mass anti-government protests were violently crushed in 2011. French teachers are staging a mass strike that could close half of schools in protest against the government's handling of the coronavirus crisis. French ministers have made keeping schools open a priority, despite a recent surge in COVID-19 cases fueled by the Omicron variant. Teachers say rules in school are confusing and constantly changing. Many primary schools have closed, as unions expect about 75% of teachers to go on the strike. It could be the biggest in decades, as 11 unions representing teachers, parents and other school staff vent their anger at the government's COVID policies. Africa has now reported over 10 million COVID cases, according to the continent's top public health official. So we've, we've hit a, an important milestone of 10 million. Speaking at an online press briefing, director of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention director John Kengasong updated the disease spread across the continent. He went on to say that the death toll stood at 223,000, with the majority reported in South Africa. The CDC director added that just over 10% of the African population are now fully vaccinated. The EU foreign policy chief says the bloc will impose sanctions on Mali in line with measures already taken by the ECOWAS group of West African states. The risk of the... Josep Borrell said that the situation in the country was deteriorating and that despite warnings to Malian authorities, there were no signs of progress. The Economic Community of West African States agreed a raft of restrictions against Mali on Sunday over the interim authorities' failure to hold democratic elections next month, as was agreed following a 2020 military coup. Italy is marking the 10th anniversary of the Costa Concordia cruise ship disaster with a day-long commemoration. 32 people died when the ship hit a reef and capsized off the Tuscan island of Giglio. 4,200 people survived, but many were injured. Members of the Coast Guard lay flowers at sea where the Costa Concordia smashed into the rocks. Masses and ceremonies have been held across the region. Here, families and friends of those who died attending a service to commemorate those lost. The events will end with a candlelight vigil at 9.45 when the ship hit the reef. 
Novak Djokovic has been drawn to play in the Australian Open despite ongoing uncertainty over whether his visa will be cancelled again by the government. We start with our number one seed for the tournament, Novak Djokovic. Despite Online, potential for the one. Serbs' bid to win a 21st Grand Slam title to be Online, ruled out by the Australian authorities, the 34-year-old defending champion has four. been drawn against unseeded fellow Serb Miamir Kecmanovic. In the first round, but Australia's immigration minister is still considering using his powers to revoke his visa. Ivory Coast football fans watching the Africa Cup of Nations are being greeted with rapid tests, masks and vaccines to try and increase the vaccination rate. Thousands of fans have stormed the Cup of Nations villages in Abidjan, where the matches are projected on giant screens. Masks are required within the fan zones and stands have been set up for awareness raising about COVID-19. Rapid tests and vaccines are also being offered at mobile clinics. One of the tournament favourites, Ivory Coast defeated Equatorial Guinea 1-0 in their first game on Wednesday. And finally, Australia has equaled its hottest day on record after a remote coastal town reported temperatures as high as 50 degrees Celsius. The temperature in Onslow, Western Australia, matched a record set in 1962 in South Australia. Onslow and the surrounding areas could see records broken again, with temperatures set to rise slightly on Friday. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Hosts Cameroon brought a goal-shy AFCON to life earlier today as Captain Vincent Abubakar and Carl Togo Kambi both scored twice in a 4-1 defeat of Ethiopia that takes the indomitable Lions through to the knockout stage with one group game to spare. Or group or Cameroon were the only team out of 24 at the tournament to score more than a single goal in the opening round of group matches when the brace of Abubakar's penalty saw them beat Burkina Faso 2-1 on Sunday. Meanwhile, Burkina Faso has uh, thrown open the battle to qualify from Group A of the African Nations Cup as they beat Cape Verde 1-0. A clever finish from Hassan Bande with six minutes left of the first half gave Kamu Malu's side the first point after they lost 2-1 to host Cameroon in their opening fixture. Ghana forward Richmond Boakier is feeling confident ahead of his team's second African Nations Cup game against Gabon despite a defeat in their first game against the Moroccan side, or Morocco. Boakia says they have prepared well and he has faith in his teammates. And Liverpool were left frustrated by 10-man Arsenal in the first leg of their Carabao Cup semi-final at Anfield, of the game which ended goalless. Uh, Granit Xhaka was dismissed after 24 minutes for denying a goal-scoring opportunity. Uh, the Swiss midfielder catching Diogo Hotter with a high challenge on the edge of his penalty area as he attempted to cut out Andrew Robertson's pass. Well, the next leg, or the second leg, takes place at the Emirates next Thursday. And that's Sports News. I'm Ayo Tsundi. Apologies. Back to you. Thank you, Ayo. And the main news again. The president today visited Ogun State to commission various landmark projects executed by the state government. He also seized the opportunity to call at the Lagos home of the late head of interim national government, Ernest Shuneko, where he commiserated with members of his family. That's your news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Stay safe. Have a good night.